Great. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, confidential containers. Um, it doesn't really matter who we are. I wanted to point out one thing, though, before we get started, which is that Miko came all the way from Finland to do this talk, mm -hmm. and he actually walked all the way here, too. So, <laughs> I know. <laughs> It's been, like, some of us have just been in this room for the last two days straight and are sinking into the chairs a little bit and sticking to the tables and all this stuff. But let's all take a minute just to wake up and get ready for 70 minutes of pure, raw excitement as we discuss confidential containers, okay? Can we? Um, this talk, this workshop, this We Hope It Works shop is mostly going to be centered around this project, Confidential Containers. Very generic name. Sorry about that. Um, Confidential Containers is a CNCF sandbox project. We became a sandbox project at the beginning of 2022. Time really flies. Um, has anybody, raise your hand if you've heard of this project already, Confidential Containers. That's actually more than I expected. Raise your hand if you've heard of Confidential Computing. Not too bad. Raise your hand if you've heard of Cloud Native. Okay, <laughs> that's, what we're, that's what we hope. Um, confidential Containers is about bringing confidential computing to Cloud native. Um, we've got a couple of different goals uh, for this workshop. The first one is just to give people a little bit of a taste of what confidential computing even is. We're aware that at KubeCon, at Cloud Native Security Con, that's not necessarily going to be familiar for everyone. So we're going to start out with an introduction to what is confidential computing, very deep subject. So it's just going to be a little taste. Then we're going to talk sort of generally about how confidential computing and cloud native stuff can fit together. And that should lead us into getting a taste of the confidential containers project, which does exactly that. We'll get our hands on with that. Those are the goals. The last goal, have fun. That's actually a mistake. Uh, we're not going to be um, having fun today. But I do think it's important just to note that this is kind of new stuff for a lot of people. Uh, so we don't have very high expectations about people just instantly understanding every single thing about this project. Uh, we don't know how many of our slides we're going to get through, maybe all of them, maybe just this one. Um, feel free to stop us even before the end if you have some question and you want us to slow down. Uh, we, we, can, we can probably give you the answer about confidential computing stuff. Um, like I said, you guys should think of yourselves as pioneers, uh, the first people um, from this community who are starting to learn about this kind of stuff. That's exciting, uh, and that's really what we're hoping for. What are we actually going to do, though? Um, here's the agenda, basically. First, like I said, introduction to confidential computing. Um, then we'll talk a little about confidential containers. Then we have some hands-on stuff. Now, in some ways, what we're presenting here is a very difficult topic to make into a hands-on workshop, and you'll see why when we try to do that. Uh, but there's things, for instance, I, I don't see anybody here with an AMD Ryzen server in their backpack. Uh, doesn't look like it. So there's some hardware issues. Oh, there's one, okay. There's some hardware questions. We've organized some things that you guys can try out and that should give you a pretty good sense of what we're talking about. So the first one is going to be a demo of encrypted container images. That'll be pretty cool. Then we're going to come back and do a little bit more theoretical stuff talking about VM-based isolation and process-based isolation. Then we're going to give you a demonstration of the confidential containers operator, which is one of the biggest features of the first release of confidential containers, uh, which just came out in, in the end of September. Um, and then we'll show you something called Enclave CC, which is pretty cool. Then we'll talk a little bit about the future of the project, some exciting vision stuff, and how you guys can get involved with confidential containers, which is really our main goal. Convince everyone here to start writing some code for the open source project. Uh, I'm optimistic, but we'll see what happens. So first things first is what is confidential computing? Maybe you guys have heard sort of this buzzword. It might be a cool new thing. Uh, let me give you a, a basic breakdown. Again, if you guys have like, questions about any of this, feel free uh, to, to stop us at any point. But a very, very common way of thinking about confidential computing is that it's about protecting data that is in use. So if you think about data, as most people tend to do day to day, uh, we already know quite a bit about protecting data that's at rest. You can put the data under your pillow, print it out, uh, put it in a bank vault, no problem. There's a lot of ways to protect data at rest. Also, data in transit, a little bit more tricky, but kind of a solved problem in other ways. We have TLS, we have things we can do to communicate securely with other people, to send data securely to other people. But what about protecting data that we're actually executing, like, you know, commands with, or that we're, you know, processing, or that we're uh, trying to run ML computations against? How are we going to do that? Uh, well, one option is confidential computing. And basically, 
what confidential computing does is it creates an enclave, which is a secure world uh, that has some kind of isolation boundary between the stuff in the enclave and the stuff outside of the enclave. Now, there's different technology out there, but a lot of things use memory encryption, um, and a lot of things map this enclave versus not enclave onto a VM. So you might think about a VM with encrypted memory um, that the host cannot read. Uh, there's, there's something kind of under, under the surface here, which is that this gives us a profound new way to think about the relationship between a host and either and a guest. And that could be a guest in a virtual machine, or it could be a guest um, in another context as well. But a new way to think about trusting the person who owns the computer that you're running on. And there's already a lot of interesting considerations for Kubernetes and Cloud Native that might be coming to mind here. We're going to get to them. But at a very basic level, it allows us to have two different worlds, a trusted one and an untrusted one. Now, isolation is only kind of half of the story with confidential computing. Right, so we have a castle, essentially. We've got these big walls with memory encryption with this other hardware technology uh, that's protecting access to data as it's being processed. But there's also another part of it, which is attestation. And that's figuring out who's actually in the castle, what's actually going on, right? It's not that useful if I have this enclave that's really secure and I have all my data inside of it, but I don't actually know what was loaded into the enclave. So confidential computing almost basically always will involve some sort of attestation where you figure out, hey, what's actually happening inside the enclave? Where did I start out with? Sometimes this is at boot, sometimes it's at runtime. There's a lot of different trade-offs here. But that's kind of the basic idea of confidential computing. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, Are we... I was pressing the shift key, not the arrow key. It's tough. So when we start talking about confidential computing and cloud native, kind of the first question we need to answer is what should go into this enclave? What should go in the secure world? And this is actually a question that you need to ask yourself whenever you're doing any confidential computing related project, because some things have to go inside. Uh, the trusted things need to go inside, and the things that are not trusted are outside. Uh, obviously, this has huge implications in terms of, oh, I'm on the wrong slide here. Okay, uh, that's the next one. Sorry, sorry. Let me first give you, give you a comparison between some traditional technologies, right? So containerization um, versus sort of virtualization versus confidential computing. How do these things compare? To be clear, if it's not clear already, we're way down the stack here, right? There's been a lot of you know, presentations about security uh, in these, over these two days, and we are like really far down get a shovel and just dig as far down the stack as you basically can. We're talking about the primitive for isolating your workload all the way at the bottom, so something like run C. And when we have look at containerization over here, um, I'm not referring so much to like using containers so much as I'm really referring to the mechanisms that something like run C uses to isolate one container from another. And there's different ways this can work. The reason we have this slide is to create a huge argument and a flame war afterwards so we'll all dislike each other. It's actually just to give you a little bit of an overview. So this is very general, but usually the way that something like Runcy will work is that there'll be a shared kernel on the guest and we'll use mechanisms like C groups um, to isolate some of the resources. This shared kernel has a huge uh, attack surface basically between the guest, so-called guest, the container, um, and the kernel, right? There's a lot of syscalls that you can make from inside of a container uh, that the kernel will service. This is a big attack surface, and if you can find a hole in the kernel, you can potentially get into other containers. So this is kind of the classic spiel about how container isolation, uh, containerization is maybe not the strongest isolation boundary. Again, we're not trying to start any wars here, but this is a, a pretty common position. So one thing that people have proposed is something like virtualization, right? Virtualization is another way to isolate workloads. And when you do virtualization, every single VM uh, is gonna have its own kernel, right? This is one of the big distinctions between like containers and VMs, is that in VMs, every VM has its own kernel. And you're also gonna be making use of a lot of hardware-related features like nested page tables that will have hardware enforcement of the guest address space. So the boundaries are thicker. Now, this is actually an extremely complicated thing to think about in some regards, thinking about, for instance, the API of syscalls, comparing that to the API of hypercalls. Is one of those more secure? Mm, that's a very interesting and complex question. But generally speaking, VM isolation is, is thought to be a little bit stronger than container isolation. There are already projects out there that take 
like containers and run them in VMs. One of them is Kata containers, another one is like Firecracker. Uh, we'll talk more about Kata containers very soon. Um, confidential computing goes a step beyond this. In the first two examples, the host is pretty much in control of everything. With containerization, for instance, the host sets up the C groups, right? Even with virtualization, the host sets up the virtual machine. They control the page tables of the guest, for instance. Uh, they control emulating the devices of the guest, things like that. Uh, they can also just dump the guest memory and read it whenever they want to. Uh, with confidential computing, let's say we've got encrypted memory. Well, the hypervisor on the host can still maybe dump the memory, but when they do that, they're just gonna be seeing a ciphertext, right? And they're not gonna have access to the keys which are stored in hardware uh, that will allow them to read the memory. They might be, the hypervisor might be part of facilitating attestation, but they're not going to be able to generate a fake attestation report because again, they don't have access to certain keys stored in hardware that they would need to do that. Okay, so like I said, bottom of the stack, containerization, kind of what we're doing now, but uh, there's much stronger isolation boundaries uh, that you can get, and it's probably self-evident why you might want that. Okay, now, hopefully this will give you a nice sense of deja vu. Uh, we've got this slide about where we should actually draw the boundary. Like I was saying, any project about confidential computing, you've got to decide what goes in the enclave and what goes outside the enclave. And the last slide actually had a little bit of a hint about this too. Like, hmm, there's some interesting trade-offs you get with containers and VMs having the kernel be you know, shared on the host or having the kernel be inside of each guest, right? That has pretty profound implications for the attack surface uh, for what, and for sharing, right? For how efficient these things are gonna be, for how much overhead each guest is gonna have, but also for how much uh, sort of shared attack surface there'll be. This kind of builds on that to some extent. So this is sort of a summation of really a couple of years of thinking uh, that has gone on in the confidential container space a little bit. In some ways, it's a very simple question. What goes inside the enclave and what goes outside the enclave? But this is a deceptively difficult thing to think about with a lot of nuance. Let me at least give you the three different options that are kind of the most reasonable. One of them is to put every individual container inside of an enclave, right? And you might be familiar with projects that have done something like this in the past. Like with SGX, there's been something like Scone uh, containers or X containers is similar. These take one container and they put it inside of an enclave. This is kind of nice because it minimizes the amount of stuff that's in the enclave. In other, other words, it minimizes the TCB, the trusted computing base. Less code inside the enclave, that seems like a good thing, right? Hmm, there are some other trade-offs we'll get to. Another approach is to put a pod of containers inside um, of the enclave. So here, there's some sharing of resources between the things in the pod, uh, but we still don't you know, have a massive amount of code in there. Another example, and this is actually one of the first things that occurs to a lot of people, is why don't we just put the entire worker node inside of an enclave? If this enclave is a VM, why don't we just stick our whole worker node in and spin up all the pods in there? Okay, <laughs> that obviously has a really big TCB that might include things like, oh, you need some sort of daemon to mount weird proprietary storage into your worker node. Uh, now this is inside of the enclave. You don't really know where this code came from. It's hard to audit. The TCB gets really big. It also means that the kubelet is inside of the enclave. That's pretty interesting. So if the kubelet's inside the enclave, now we really care a lot about the API between the kubelet. Um, uh, the, the kubelet's API is now really the focus of, well, it's part of the attack surface of the enclave. That's what I'm trying to say here. So profoundly, there's kind of a bit of a trade-off Enclave smaller means smaller TCB, um, but when you make the enclave bigger, it gets easier to share things, right? You can imagine, for instance, if I have every container in its own enclave, well, I'm gonna have to download the container image for every single enclave, uh, right? And if a bunch of those are exactly the same image, I still have to download it again and again and again. So not great for sharing. And sharing has, is a very general term too, like what about sharing on the network, right? Hmm, if I have every container inside the own enclave, I have to do a bunch of work to make sure that I'm securely communicating with other containers, right? I can't just throw stuff out on the network and hope that it works out because it's gonna go out into the untrusted world. If you look at something like a pod, well, maybe we actually now have network namespaces that are inside the enclave. So pods can communicate with each other inside the enclave. That's kind of nice. Uh, also, maybe we could share some of the container images inside the enclave, right? Okay. So a bunch of trade-offs. I'm gonna give you a big spoiler here, which is that confidential containers took the approach in the middle. So it is pod-centric virtualization. That's kind of the hallmark 
of the design. There are other projects that do the other things, like there's a project called libk run that can do individual containers inside of pods. There's also something called Constellation, which is node-centric, right? There's a lot of complicated trade-offs. Suffice to say, confidential containers, we bet on the middle one because we think it's a good compromise and we think it's the best, but this is a big argument that we're not gonna have, right, at this moment. Um, I wanna give a little bit of overview just generally speaking, there's a lot of confidential containers or confidential computing technologies on the market right now. Uh, if you're looking at VM-based enclaves, the two uh, biggest, most well-known ones are AMD SEV. This has sort of three different generations. They're actually referred to as features, but they're generations. SEV, SEV ES, and SEV SNP. Uh, Intel also has Intel TDX. Uh, there's a bunch of other options as well. We're also going to be talking quite a bit about doing this not at the VM level, but at the process level, right? And looking at some process-based technologies where we have uh, uh, just parts of a process isolated. This is SGX, which you guys might be more familiar with. It's been around a lot longer and is a lot more mature. Um, so we'll be talking some about both of those. But before we get like way deeper into theory land, we wanna go over into demo land a little bit and give you something to try. What on earth could we be trying at this point? Well. If you remember back to the agenda, we're not diving straight into things. We just want to give you a little bit of a taste of encrypted container images. Uh, you can sort of imagine if we're going to be doing all this work to have our images be executed inside of an enclave, we probably want to be protecting these images either with signatures or with encryption um, while they're in the registry and while we're pulling them down. So this is some existing technology that's already sort of standardized, uh, that confidential containers didn't exist, but that confidential containers leans on completely. And I think Miko, is gonna show us how to do this. Yeah, we have to switch laptops though. Everybody look yeah, over there. Uh, I, I, can, I can keep talk, talking about the, the slides for a little, little bit here. Oh, so yeah. uh, so the, oh okay. Uh, but, uh, so we have uh, three demos today. Um, the, the first one, which is, about this uh, the, which is about these encrypted containers, is uh, the one that if you are interested in doing like hands-on hands uh, work yourself, to, to follow uh, follow along, this is the, this is the part that you you can you can participate. So we have this uh, QR code which takes you to uh, one of these repositories I, I created for for this demo, and the, the link uh, is also shown on on the slides um, in black. So apologies for the for the color, but it, it's there. So um, get, getting to that. Um, Getting to that GitHub repository uh, will show you detailed instructions, but I also have the in, in instructions on, on the slides, and then I'm, I'm planning to use the terminal, terminal here to kind of walk you, walk you through the. You can download the slides, by the way, um, from like KubeCon website. Download the slides, click on the link, or use your phone. Yeah, but uh, encrypted containers, they have been around for, for a while. I think uh, the early proposals uh, how to do encrypted containers, uh, how to add the necessary um, containers, metadata in, into images and, and, and registries. The proposals have been around since 2018, and I think one of the pioneers in, in this space has been our tax security lead. Um, next, next one. Um, talking about uh, how, how this uh, flow, image encryption flow works and what are the tools you need to use to, to get your container images uh, encrypted. So starting from, from the left, basically you'll find uh, projects like uh, Scopi, Scopio and ImageCrypt. These are the, the projects that originally implemented uh, the, the basics of uh, uh, containers layer encryption and one of the most recent additions is this uh, concept of uh, key providers and external key providers plugin which is uh, also something that we are using in, in confidential containers. So the basic idea is that uh, uh, these, these key providers they, 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 they manage all the the details of uh, how, how you're managing your encryption keys. Uh, in, in this particular case, it's not the, the layer encryption key itself, but it's, it's basically um, a, a key that you're using to, to encrypt your layer encryption key. And the key provider API 
supports two, two functions, basically the wrap and, and unwrap APIs on, on, uh, on, on both sides of both encryption and, and decryption. And uh, in confidential co containers, we have this component called uh, attestation agent, which is basically what, what is our key, key, key provider uh, key provider Im implementation. Uh, on, underneath the attestation agent, we have uh, various uh, key, key broker client plugins that basically then support uh, the connection between um, the actual key, key, key management service and uh, um, the attestation agent side of, side of things. Um, in, in this uh, workshop today, we're kind of going to focus on what's on, on the left-hand side, and then later on I have a demo how to use the uh, decryption in, in, in an enclave en environment, basically. Um, we have, a, in Confidential Containers Project, we have this uh, sample KPC, or sa sample, sample key provider implementation that we are going to be setting up next. Uh, so if those of you who are, who are, who are willing to try, try it out, you may have already find, find your, your way to, to the repository. And uh, maybe I'll just use this one because it's, it's easier. So um, um, clone, cloning the, the repository is, is the first thing. And uh, I'm, I, I try to make it as, as easy as possible to use and, and follow. There is no magic, so what we are doing here in, in, in the demo is it, uh, when, when you run this, uh, after, after cloning the repository, it, it, it also clones the attestation agent as a, as a Git sub-module uh, onto, onto your system. And uh, make setup command, da basically does, does, does two things, so um, it, it builds the, the sample key provider that we have in our attestation agent repository and, and, and sets it up and, and runs it in its own, own container. And the container on, on, on your system uh, would then be called uh, key provider. And this is basically automated by, by this um, make, make setup command. And the other, the other, uh, the other uh, step the make setup executes it. It basically uh, sets up a, another container that has the uh, has the network to connect to the gRPC service provided by this sample sample key key provider. And that, uh, that's the the other container is where this encryption encryption basically happens. Uh, if anyone is desperately trying this and wants, I can come out to you and. Uh, look at your, the error you're getting and say, oh, that's weird, and then uh, move on, if that would be useful. Um. Um, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just try this one here. You can, uh, let's see. Let's see. Just before the presentation, I realized that this talk might end up being a, a, a hands-on workshop. How to get my screen sharing to work? <laughs> let, let's see. Let's see how this how this thing goes. If it doesn't work, then. Yeah, I, I sent the, uh, the other one. So, where's the focus? There's also, um, I've, I've done a pre-recording of, of this whole flow. So, the third option 
uh, would be to, to replay this ASCII and MR recording. It's, it's basically doing the exact, st exact same steps that we are going to be executing here, com command line. Um, Yeah, sorry about that. So it's uh, it's uh, it's this repository under my name. M Y T H I on GitHub is Miko. Um, you can probably find him from there. And I, by the way, I forgot about I forgot uh, to mention the prerequisites or de dependencies. So this, um, of course, as I mentioned, runs things in in containers. So you need to have a container runtime, and of course, being able to clone the repository is is something that is that is needed. Uh, to to speed things up a little bit, I've I've noticed that this. Um, Get, getting this key, key provider container prepared takes a, a, a bit of time, so I've, uh, I've I've started. I think I have those running. So make uh, I'm not able to see very well what I'm typing here, but uh, does it say make encrypt now? <laughs> Make. Yeah, the brilliance of this tiling window manager Miko has is that he cannot see his screen. <laughs> that seems close. Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm doing here is just uh, pulling Hello World container image, which is uh, a single layer container image, using Scopio, storing it locally and uh, then running another Scopio command to encrypt the container layer. And uh, uh, to tell Scopio uh, which key provider to use, I, I have to specify this ocicrypt.conf config file, and uh, this is basically a pretty simple config file. It, it just uh, tells Scopio that, hey, we have an attestation agent key provider serving gRPC in, in this localhost uh, uh, network address in, in this particular port. And looks like it, it, it successfully encrypted the container layer. It's only one layer, one layer that's, uh, that got uh, encrypted. Um, that's because the image, Hello World image, has only, on, only one, one layer. With image encryption, it is possible to choose whether you want basically want to encrypt all of your container image layers or just um, a, a subset of, of those layers. This might be handy in, in cases where you are using some very big base image that doesn't contain any confidential information that you would have to encrypt, you would only get to encrypt those layers where you are storing your sensitive, sensitive data, for instance, like AI machine learning models that you, you want to make available to, to your customers on a public container registry. You might want to then en encrypt those container layers that uh, contain this sensitive information. And then uh, let's uh, take a a bit more closer look uh, about uh, our encryption encryption results. So I, I ran this make check, which basically just uh, gives uh, like Scopio inspect of all your all the container uh, meta metadata information. So the first first step shows you that. Uh, we have an encrypted layer available in, in that image. And this is the new media type that's been proposed to be part of the OCI image uh, spec. It's not officially there yet, but uh, this is how it's envisioned to, to look like. So it's, uh, uh, it's an encrypted layer, what we have. And then two new annotations have been added to the image. 
uh, these two, two annotations basically sp specify uh, the key provider uh, key provider information that's em embedded in, in, in the layer layer annotations me metadata. And then if we pick the first annotation, I'm, I'm not showing the, the annotation values, they are pretty long. I think it, it was, I, I thought it was more, more useful to basically just kind of show you what the annotation labels are and, and then uh, the keys, they are not, not, so, not so relevant. But here I have another, the last, last step here is that uh, I've basically taken the, the first annotation value and then uh, base64 uh, decoded uh, to show you how, how, how it looks. And this, is, uh, this uh, value here, it's, it's basically um, the key provider specific me metadata, what, what it, it stores in, in, in the container layer uh, to be a then able to, to, to la later on de decrypt, de decrypt the container in in information or the container layers. So this is uh, our sample key provider specific uh, sa sample metadata that is stored. But if you ever want or see another key provider e implementation, they, they might e implement this type of meta metadata a little bit differently. I think it's going back to the slides. But, uh, Encrypted containers are, of course, nice, but there are also some challenges, challenges with them, and uh, and these are basically uh, some of the things that we have tried to solve in in our confidential containers project. So the two two challenges, um, Tobin talked about uh, memory encryption and. Uh, um, like. Uh, the reason why confidential computing exists, so you are processing, um, without confidential computing, you might be processing confidential information in, in plain in, in, in your CPU, uh, in, your system, in your system memory. So uh, that doesn't go away, uh, or that problem still remains without any confidential computing. And uh, uh, the un unwrapped key information, um, would still be uh, one one such e example that you 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 are processing in in plain with without confidential computing. The other example, which or the other the other challenge, uh, which is a bit more severe, is that uh, the container layers they still have to be unpacked on on the uh, on the node file file system in in order for the container runtime to to run. The, the con container, and uh, when when you are when you are uh, decrypting your container limit uh, container layers content on on a host file system that might be visible to to people or entities like C CSPs, that's not 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 a good thing. Um, that's the wrong computer. <laughs> Thank you. So um, how we are solving that these two problems with uh, confidential containers. So, first, of, of course, uh, the the con confidential computing and memory encryption already solves the, the first problem. So, handling all your keys in in, in confidential enclaves uh, is, is 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 solving the first problem. The other one required a bit bit more thinking because um, we were facing some of the li limitations how, how, the, how the Kubernetes and, and container runtimes architecture works. So on, 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 the, on the left hand side in, in, in this diagram, so if we look at the VM isolation technologies like and projects like, like Kata containers, so even though you are protecting your host system from untrusted workloads in, in VMs, you have your images being pulled outside the VM environment. So Kubelet 
when it starts a container on, on a node, it, it, it talks to the, the container container runtime, like con, con, container D to pull in the images. Con, container D is, is, is responsible for pu pu pulling, pulling these I images on, 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 the, on the node uh, as of today without any, any changes. And, and then container D starts an OCI compatible runtime with Kata containers. It's, it's Kata run, runtime that is then responsible for first uh, creating the VM environment and, and then starting the containers in, 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 in the VM, VM en environments. But the thing is, uh, the images, they are being, they are being pulled and uh, unpacked on, on the host. And in, in case of encrypted containers, of course, also de decrypted. But with, with co confidential containers, we're changing the flow, how these images are, are being, being managed. And uh, the basic idea is that the, all this image manipulation, if I can call them manipulation, like pulling, uh, un unpacking, or pulling, decrypting, and un un unpacking is moved into the TEE environment completely. And this has required changes in container D in, in, in particular because we, we needed container D to support this uh, image pool offload. That's, that's how we are calling it. In, in the future, it's going to be something along those lines that the container D supports just like opaque image transfer API and, and, and then different runtimes can Im, Im, implement how they are, uh, different runtimes can then choose how they are implementing this particular image tra transfer service. But you can, you can think of it like a, a Kata sandbox, uh, TEE Kata sandbox telling container D that, hey, I'm, I'm your image transfer service. So I'm, I'm from now on, I'm, I'm handling all the image transfer functions for you. So when Kubelet, wants to start a container, container D uh, knows that, hey, okay, I, I ha I'll have to start a pod. In case of confidential containers, uh, the pod would be um, a, a, a secure uh, encrypted VM that, that gets started, and, and, and then the image transfer function implemented by the Kata sandbox is, is responsible for, for pulling the image. Uh, now, not just like this image pooling, but then we also need to do this uh, uh, image uh, decryption key uh, retrieval from the key provider service. So uh, in, in, in the trusted uh, execution environment, the Kata, Kata environment, we have a component called uh, uh, attestation agent that again knows based on the layer metadata information like where the, where the, the key provider um, is, is located and, and how, to, how to get the keys to decrypt, how to get the keys to decrypt the, the layer en encryption decryption key uh, on, on the node or, or in, in the sandbox, sorry. Um, between, between the trusted execution environment and this key broker service, we have uh, an attestation in, in place. So before, before the, the key broker service is, is able to, um, or before the, the KBS key broker service um, sends the key, key necessary keys back to the, the trusted, en en trusted execution environment, uh, attestation takes place to make sure that uh, the VM environment is, uh, uh, is, is re a genuine trusted e execution environment that it, it has all the, the necessary parameters in, in place, place like a hash of the, uh, the kernel, uh, kernel image or init RD, uh, init RD image and all these, all these uh, right parameters that uh, are kind of the characteristics of a, of a trusted, uh, trusted VM. Yep, next one. Uh, with, with, the, with the 
process uh, um, isolation, this uh, problem is a little bit different because we don't have the luxury of having this uh, full VM environment where to, where to process these images. Um, um, but b before going into how, how we have solved it, I, I also wanted to um, say a few, few words about how, how this process, process isolation worked. Tobin already briefly talked about it. Uh, originally, the idea of, of process isolation um, was so that you have a, um, a, an application that you are building from scratch and this application that you are building has two sides or two different worlds, like the trusted world and the un untrusted world. And when you're designing your application, during the implementation, you decide that what are the, the parameters that your application needs to process in, in the trusted execution environment or trusted world, and what are the... What, what are the what, what, are the, what, what is the functionality that doesn't need to be in, in, in the trusted execution environment that can, can run outside of it? Uh, this model won't work with confidential containers, and it, it has the problem that uh, it, it only works in, in cases when you're building your application from scratch, but this is not something that we can use. Uh, or it's, it's very hard, and especially with con confidential containers, so we, have, we want to be able to run unmodified uh, applications, uh, pulling container images, pulling encrypted container images, and being able to just run them and, and process the, the sensitive information in, 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 in confidential computing environments is, is basically what we want. Fortunately, there are projects uh, available that basically allow you to run unmodified applications and still uh, being able to use the kind of the process isolation characteristics. Uh, uh, Tobin mentioned scope, uh, SCONE, but then we also have projects like uh, the open source projects like Oc Oculum or, or Grameen. These are library OS projects that basically uh, allow you to run unmodified, content, um, unmodified applications in, in trusted uh, execution environments. And uh, how, uh, yeah, how we are using these library OS projects in our confidential containers work, what we are calling as Enclave, Enclave CC. So uh, we um, are running these um, services that uh, need to be run in, in confidential computing and environments. We, we run them using using these library OS uh, library OS uh, co components. So in, inside a pod with with process based uh, confidential containers, we don't have a VM anymore. We just have a, a, we just have the the virtual concept called pod, but in inside the pod, we are still implementing our image transfer service function um, as a container. This is just a container that we are running using. What well, right now we are using the Oculum Oculum project to do that. So we have a, a component called Enclave Agent, which registers itself as, a, as an image transfer service again uh, to, to, to container D uh, and that's responsible for handling all the image uh, manipulation functions and the key, key retrievals using the key broker to, together with the key, key broker service. And then uh, the Enclave agent is also capable of managing This is not part of the presentation. So. Wow. <laughs> it's uh, alien 
invasion. The speakers had enough of my speak. We can just shout if that's yeah. necessary. <laughs> So Enclave agent runs in, in, a, in an Oculum based uh, library OS environment implementing all the image pool, uh, image unpack. And, and then it, it's also, like I said, I was, uh, I was getting to the, the last piece. It's, it's automatically wrapping the original container application together with all the necessary library OS components. So when, when, it, when it gets the time, to, to run the actual application workload. What we do is we first start the library OS environment, and, and then we start the actual workload image in, inside the, the library OS en environment. One thing, one thing extra what we have to do with the process-based uh, confidential containers is that we need to be uh, there's like a two-stage process. So we are pulling an encrypted container image, but since we are not in a VM environment, we have no secure place to unpack it. So what we have to do is we decrypt the container image, but then we have to encrypt it again on, on, on the host file system using the mechanisms provided by these library OS implementations, they, they, they support or um, they have this uh, feature called protected files. So when doing um, writes inside the library OS environment, the library OS environment automatically encrypts all the writes to the host file system. And, uh, that's how we store the unpacked container images. But then again, still on, on the host side, all of the container content is, uh, is, is en encrypted in, in, a, in a way that it is also like uh, confidentially protecting. So if somebody had the, the access to the node and was able to find your container images, it wouldn't be able to tell what is inside your container images. All, in, all, the, all, the, all the file file names and all, all the, the uh, files metadata is also fully encrypted. And then uh, once, the, once the application container starts, the application or the, the library always uh, implementation is then again able to uh, decrypt the intermediate encrypted format and then start the application. So pretty lengthy explanation, but uh, uh, so is the implementation because we don't have the luxury of, of storing all of these this, uh, containers uh, image content in, in a VM environment, but we have to, to, to rely on, on doing something on, on the host, on, on, the, on the bare metal side. Um, but really, um, you might think that these are so different things that uh, uh, they can't be in, in the same pro project, but uh, that, that is not true. We actually have uh, quite, quite a few components that both the VM-based and, and the process-based uh, uh, mechanisms are, are sharing. So I talked about the attestation agent. Uh, we have uh, Rust-based implementations for the OCI crypt and image RS. Image RS is basically the, the Rust crate that we are using to, to do all this image pulling from, from registries. So both the Enclave CC and the, the Kata containers-based uh, functionality, they are, they are actually sharing quite, quite a few uh, of, of these uh, building blocks. And from what, what is, uh, I guess, the most important thing or two important things is from that uh, from the end user perspective, this is uh, pretty, this is completely transparent. So the end, end user, when, when, de when deploying the, the workload, only needs to, to, to choose what is the runtime environment uh, he or she wants to run this container. So we, we do this uh, using this uh, Kubernetes uh, runtime class 
mechanism uh, uh, with, with kata containers and, and as uh, Tobin is going to show you next, uh, how, how these run, runtime classes are, are being configured. So the user can choose like between Enclave CC runtime class or kata, kata CC runtime class. That's about it. Yep. Okay. So yeah, it's time for another thing that hopefully you guys will be able to try. This one's a little bit more complicated than the last one, but you know the first step at least is go to the QR code or download the slides and look at the link. Or this one's on my GitHub. So if you go to GitHub slash user or whatever slash fits them, F-I-T-Z-T-H-U-M, F-I-T-Z-T-H-U-M, that's me, and look at my repositories and you'll find this one that's um, the demo. So I'm going to go over to this repository right now. I'm going to give you a, a fair warning that this will require you to have some kind of Kubernetes cluster uh, that you can use. And also, you got to use container D with your cluster, or you've really got no hope of making this work. Um, but this repository isn't going away. Um, so if you aren't able to sort it out right now, uh, even with some help, this is something to look into afterwards. Um, especially if you actually happen to have AMD or Intel hardware that supports confidential computing. This will walk you through how to actually try out um, the project. So this little demo that we're going to do is, is mainly an adaptation of the project's official quick start guide. And I would really recommend that you check out the confidential containers quick start guide at some point because it lays out all of this stuff. As Miko was saying, we have two different things that we support in confidential containers. One of them is VM-based enclaves, the other one is process-based enclaves. I'm going to show you now how to set up uh, confidential containers with VM-based enclaves, which is basically a takeoff on CATA containers. So the first step is not this. Don't try and SSH into the node. Oh, also ignore that. You should update thing. Um, and let me just say in advance that, uh, oh, oops. Um, in advance that I have a butterfly keyboard from Apple, so I will not be able to type anything accurately. Um, but uh, geez, as you can see. Anyway, so first of all, I just have a single node cluster here. Uh, it's important that this thing is labeled as a worker node, um, or this will not work, but that's noted here in this little guide. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is install an operator. So we realized pretty early on that our project was really complicated and that it was hard for developers to work on it and even harder for end users to consume it. So we created a Kubernetes operator that will automatically install everything you need. And this is also tested in the CI. So hopefully it'll work. Uh, the first step is to just apply this uh, thing. You can see it does something. And then we're just going to check that uh, you know it worked. So we have a namespace for all of our uh, pods that are used as part of the operator, which is confidential containers system. Uh, that's our namespace. You pretty much always want to use that namespace. Uh, when you're checking out what's running. You can see we have this CC operator controller manager and ready two out of two, nice. Uh, despite the brief alien invasion earlier, the demo gods so far are doing okay. This operator is a CRD, so custom resource description. We need to actually now create a custom resource, which is gonna be the CC runtime. And you do that by copying this second YAML thing. And this will take a little bit longer to, uh, same thing, to, work, um, you can see uh, this CC operator daemon install thing is still thinking. Um, so we'll run this a few times. Um, yeah, great. This is doing a lot of things behind the scenes. It's installing CATA, uh, like the components on the host, which is like the CATA shim. It's installing the hypervisor that we're going to use. It's also installing like the firmware that we're going to use inside of the VM. It's installing a lot of different components. Um, and you can tell that those things are installed uh, because when we have the operators finished installing, we can do kubectl get runtime class. And as Miko was saying, we use runtime classes to actually switch between the different ways um, of using confidential containers. So you see we've got a bunch of options here. We've got this CATA runtime class. When you use the CC operator, all of these are going to be confidential containers. Um, but CATA and CATA QMU are both going to not require you to have any specific hardware. So that's what we're going to use today. Uh, then we've got CATA CLH, which is no specific hardware, but uses Cloud Hypervisor instead of QMU. Uh, then we've got CATA CLH TDX, which is Cloud Hypervisor and uses TDX. Probably you guys are not going to be able to do that now. Um, 
We also have Catechumu SEV, uh, which is the SEV version, obviously, and Catechumu TDX, so a few different options here. To use one of these is really simple, actually. So we are going to, if you cloned this repository, you'll see that it comes with this nginxcc.yaml. And really, the only difference between this YAML file and any other is that I'm using this CATA runtime class. That's it. So it's pretty transparent to switch from a standard workload to a confidential containers workload. Now, this container image that I'm using here, this Bitnami Nginx thing, is not encrypted, right? We didn't think we quite had the time or the bandwidth to show you how to pull in an encrypted image with CATA CC, although I think Miko's gonna show you how to do it with Enclave CC for processes shortly. Uh, so we're just pulling an unencrypted image. Again, the quick start guide has all the instructions for encrypting your own images and pulling them and doing this on TDX and SEV. So if you guys have the interest, and especially if you have the hardware, please check it out. We want as many people to try that as possible. Anyway, so we're going to run this thing. Uh, and hopefully it'll do something. So. There we go, so this is running. Now, this looks an awful lot like what would happen always when you uh, run a pod. Uh, so I'm gonna do one little thing to you to show that something kind of interesting is happening here. And that's this command uh, that we've got down at the bottom where we're actually gonna use crycuddle to talk to containerd and ask what images we pulled on the host. Um, and first I'll just list all of the images that have been pulled. It doesn't quite fit on the screen, so let me um, then grep for the one that we just were doing, and you can see nothing shows up. So this container image was not pulled on the worker node. This container image was pulled by the CATA agent inside of the VM. And when you use an encrypted image and you're pulling inside of a confidential guest, that starts to give you some pretty powerful guarantees about who can access that image um, and how uh, the data will actually be processed by it. Okay. I think we're gonna move on to other demos, but if people are looking on this, flag me down, I'll come around and we can put our heads together here. Or again, try it out after the fact, look at the quick start guide. Like I said, especially if you have access to the hardware, try it out um, and you know, hunt me down on the CNCF Slack uh, or via email or something and let me know how it went for you because you know, first release is pretty new. We really wanna gather feedback about using this stuff, both from a developer's perspective and from just like any random person we can get to try it. So that's that little demo. Um, now I think, okay, I'll give them the QR code from, from here. So we have another demo, which is doing something pretty similar, but using Enclave CC. So Enclave CC is the process based version of this, basically same thing, but with SGX, and scan the QR code. <laughs> and just, you take that. As Tobin said, this is all pretty new. What I have here next is even, even newer than that because I got this thing in a demoable shape on, on my flight while waiting for my connecting flight. So uh, pretty fresh, I, I would say. Uh, one thing again, one second. So. Some screen troubles again. So what I wanted to say, so Oh, but yeah, you saw this QR code already, so it uh, it, it takes you to um, yet another Askinema video re recording. So just play uh, to get back to to get back to it offline. This is basically the scripts that I'm now running that demonstrates this whole functionality. I'm I'm not and I'm now feeling pretty lucky that I, I don't have to type in all the the kubectl commands myself, but these are kind of scripted. I, I was using this script to prepare the, the, the ASCII NEMA recording, so now I just get to uh, kind of re replay the exact same steps here, and because of this uh, screen sharing problems and not being able to see things correctly, um, it, it helps a lot that I, I can just uh, use this uh, little hel helper script here. So. Uh, 
what I'm demonstrating here is, uh, like Tobin mentioned, the Enclave CC, um, the process-based uh, setup. Uh, this runs on SGX, but um, my demo has a nice little tweak that it, it runs using this uh, simulated build. So I, it kind of runs Oculum library OS components as if they were in, in, a, in a real SGX environment, but I have this kind of simulated build enabled for, for this demo, demo purposes, so that makes it possible to run it from, from my laptop uh, uh, completely. So let's see, so the, if I remember correctly, the Yeah, so uh, it's it just the checking that the cluster is, is in a good shape. It, it, it shows you a, a couple of things. So I, we, we'll, um, we have the, the custom container D installed um, on, under a different host uh, path here. And, and then Enclave CC has this uh, special container D shim. Uh, that implements all this uh, custom functionality like this image uh, transfer service or offload. These are all um, implemented by this uh, shim run e version 2 binary that is also uh, here. Uh, for Enclave CC, we have the Enclave CC runtime class configured in, in, in the cluster. And then there is something wrong again. What it was supposed to do was show the, the runtime class name, but it, it, it failed. Um, okay, but moving on to the next, next uh, step, I hope my cluster is still in, in a good shape. So um, the first or the, the next uh, step is that I'm, I'm showing what, what happens if I'm trying to run uh, the encrypted container image. Without, without the, uh, the Enclave CZ run, runtime environment, but for some reason the cluster is not in a shape, in a good shape right now. Can you open the link? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one. Oh, go to it. Yeah. I can't scan it. Uh -huh. We only have like five minutes. Yeah. Left. Okay. We'll skip the demo. The the cluster wasn't in in a shape, but the the basic idea was to just show that it it runs the encrypted. Uh, container image uh, using, uh, using on Enclave CC. So the, the next step would have been, okay, the image decryption fails. Um, and then the, the, the next one after that was that I'm adding the runtime class uh, Enclave CC and, and then the same container image, it, it, um, it, it runs correctly and, and then just like printing hello world in, in, in the logs. So apologies for the demo, demo hassle. I don't know what happened to my, my cluster. I just well, tested it one hour ago. So <laughs> It's kind of a good thing because we are out of time. We are running out of anyway. time. So, yeah. um, we have a couple things to wrap up. I'll run through these kind of quickly, and then there'll be time for some questions. And I mean, we'll be around a little bit. I got to go to the airport, but we'll be around a little bit if you guys want to talk about this stuff. First of all, we've shown extremely basic things today, like uh, unencrypted one pod running one unencrypted container images, image, like. The, the goals of confidential containers are way bigger than that, and we're actually already at a place in the community that's way farther along. We just wanted to make this something that people could understand. Here's some huge things we didn't cover, for instance. We didn't talk at all about signed 
container images, right? So we talked about encrypted container images, but signed container images can be used in conjunction or as an alternative to encrypted container images. Really powerful, really important. We didn't really talk about how attestation works. So we measure the whole stack of the guest. We make sure that we know exactly what's running inside of the enclave. Doing that on different hardware is pretty interesting, pretty complicated, so we skipped it. Uh, we also didn't talk about a huge, huge bombshell for certain Kubernetes people, which is that we don't trust the Kubernetes control plane, right? So you may have noticed that the kubelet is outside of the enclave. We don't trust the kubelet, we don't trust the control plane. That's pretty darn weird for some people. We believe in this thing called deprivileging orchestration. So we want the control plane to be able to orchestrate all the workloads without ever seeing confidential information. And that's pretty interesting. Uh, that's something we would love to talk to you guys about afterwards, by the way, if it rings. Uh, if, it, if it seems suspicious or if it seems cool or seems interesting, provocative, anything like that. Here's a couple use cases that we're pretty excited about. One of them is secure software supply chains. Obviously, that's a big deal right now. Think about if you could have a software supply chain where everything was built inside of enclaves and where the build manifest that is produced contains hardware evidence that proves that it was built inside of an enclave, that proves exactly what that enclave looked like when the build was done. Uh, and then think about this. You could also use that uh, as basically an admission controller for confidential containers. So you could say, okay, I'm going to have my workloads run in confidential containers, but they will only run, you know, based, I will only run containers that have been built inside of confidential containers. Or what about like the firmware of confidential containers? What if we could build that inside of confidential containers and, you know, have this manifest that has hardware root of trust connected to it? Pretty cool idea. So we think there's profound implications for how you can securely build software. Um, another idea is like, what about you know, machine learning where I have really sensitive data and someone else has really powerful hardware. Right now, confidential computing doesn't really have very good device support, but in the next two or three years, uh, like IO, eh, really one to two years, things to support IO GPUs with confidential computing, that's gonna happen. Uh, so you know, can I lend my data to someone else so they can process it without being able to read it? Or what about somebody else giving me their you know, data and then I can process it for them without me being able to read it. There's also people who've been talking about, oh, hold on, confidential containers and things like the blockchain. Okay, I'm not gonna get into that. But you can see there are a lot of profound use cases for this. And in general, the idea of separating the trust of the people who are hosting the machines and the people who are running the workload is a big idea that we could think can kind of transform uh, a lot of things in cloud native and elsewhere. So we really want people to get involved um, with this project, like I said, we're a CNCF project. We're kind of young. We've got a bunch of big plans. Like we've got a bunch more hardware stuff to support. We've got a bunch of ideas about how to do attestation best. Like I said, we're sort of looking at the Kubernetes control plane, the best way to integrate that, the best way to use all of the projects that have been talked about already here, right? There's a ton of security projects that have been talked about. Hmm, let's just go down the list. Do they fit with confidential containers? What does it take to bring these together? We want to know that about your project, how it can fit with confidential computing. Right? We want to be the people who figure that out. Uh, so we've got a Slack channel in the CNCF workspace. Uh, if you scan this QR code, it'll take us to our GitHub. That has a link to our community meetings. We have weekly community meetings. Uh, this is a growing community. It's cool technology. It's a cool thing to look at even as a hobby. It's just an interesting thing that is growing. And I think we have a lot of great, nice, fun people um, working on it. So that's the pitch for you guys to come and help us out and really figure out what it means to do confidential computing in cloud native, because we think it's gonna be a big, big deal over the next few years. So with that, I think we maybe have some time for a couple questions if anybody has them, hopefully. Yeah. Anything? Oh, way over there. I can't hear you at all. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the mics or I'll just, I'll walk over to you. How just about that? Repeat the question then. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was when should we consider using confidential containers and when not? Like are there unregulated things that people don't really care about or are there workloads where it's particularly important or not? And shouldn't have walked by the speaker. 
And basically, I think what you can think about here is that there is some cost of confidential computing, the hardware technology. It is designed to minimize overheads, and it does. Usually, confidential computing might have something like, ooh, low single percentage, like performance hit for like CPU-like benchmarks, like reading and writing memory. It's still very fast, because that's what it's built to do. Uh, but there's some performance overhead. The main thing is actually that there's cost to doing it, because you need special servers that have this technology. So the main question is going to be, do I want to pay a little bit extra to have my things run in a more secure context? And that's mainly going to be like regulated industries, like you were saying. That's where we really see confidential computing changing things. As every kind of workload that right now people are like, ooh, I don't know, can I move this to the cloud? I'm not sure if I want my data to you know, be out of my hands, right? That's where it's like, hmm, this could have huge, huge potential. It's true, there's, there's plenty of people who already are happy uh, with the security that they've got, and you know, long may that continue, uh, but stronger isolation boundaries hypothetically benefit everyone, uh, but there is some cost to it as well, so, cool. I think we might be out of time, but if anyone else has anything, then. One last one, sounds like. Yeah? Oh, which, 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 which part? Uh, I, in, in workshop one, I got, hold on, let me pull up where I'm still the, waiting. It might just take some time if you are waiting for the key provider service. Yeah, well, yeah, it yeah. took a very long time. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a Mac user myself. Uh, yeah. Tobin tested it. He told me it doesn't work. And then no, I, I, I on Intel him. works great. I, I'll take a look. I know that M1 and containers have a, some little snags going on there. Um, but it, it should, it, it, there is a way that this should work. Uh, so I'll talk to you in a second. Sounds good. Cool. Anything else? What's next? Thanks for giving it a try. By yeah, the way, thanks. so it's uh, much appreciated. <laughs> cool. And yeah, thanks for coming, everybody, putting up with this like weird new thing um, and, and uh, our, our weird demos that kind of worked. And uh, hopefully, you check out the project. Oh, sorry. So, so I see that the, uh, in, in the GPU isn't supported yet. Can you talk about the, the status of that or, or the thoughts about getting GPU? Yeah, so it, generally speaking, uh, GPU support in confidential computing, you're going to need to go to hardware manufacturers such as AMD and Intel and also maybe NVIDIA, people who make the devices, and talk to them about these things. There are some things kind of in the works right now, some standards uh, that are being created for like the PCI SIG and things like that. Some of this is sort of public, some of it's kind of not. So I'm not going to give you any timelines for when this will be like ready, but I would say that in the next one or two years, we will start seeing like devices where I can have a confidential VM and then I can attach a GPU to the confidential VM and have an attestation of the GPU also be part of the attestation of the virtual machine and then be able to transparently share like memory between those things. So I don't have to re-encrypt everything when it goes out to the GPU. I have a way to securely share my data to the GPU uh, with my confidential VM. That's kind of the vision and that will happen uh, in the next few years. Obviously, it's going to bring with it some complexity in how we validate these measurements, and we're going to need to figure out a way to implement it with confidential containers. Um, but support in it in, for that in VMs is coming. Cool. Okay, this is the last chance for anyone else to have any questions. I think we are out of time. Okay. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.